So welcome everybody back here to the Martin Siegel Theater Center at the Graduate Center of CUNY. My name is Frank Henschler from the Siegel Theater Center and I put this prelude festival together. It's our 20th anniversary, so it's a very special one. It's a very important one to us. And um, since we are at the university, we feel the importance uh, of education institutions and academia um, often is overlooked. It has a tremendous influence in the panel before we just talked about 50,000 students perhaps. Uh, uh, graduate in this uh, year alone, every year. Um, a lot of money also goes into providing actually services for the theaters, for the professional theaters. It's not really um, often acknowledged. Uh, and the question is, how do we spend those resources? What do we educate the students for? What are the new challenges I think we have at the time? Also, of political complex situations, of social complex situations. It's a logical problem, so we have to react. What do we do? And, um, and we have a panel that we uh, tried um, to open up. Everybody will uh, uh, introduce themselves, give a short statement, and then we have a discussion, then we will open up to uh, audience um, questions. We would also like to uh, welcome our viewers on HowlRound, and we going to do a little experiment, which we did uh, before. going to ask three for people in the audience right off the bat, what comes to your mind when you hear academia and professional theater, what, what's right, what's wrong, what's missing? Can you start for a minute? Uh, what's missing from academia and professional theater is the deep relationship between the two and feeding off of each other and being able to write scholarship um, and be in a room with practitioners and, and not have this divide between our worlds. Uh, being a failure of the New York City school system and an unacademic, uh, I always found that education was missing uh, excitement. You know, if you really want to touch people like myself, then it, you should, I should be excited about going to school. And I never was. And that's what's missing. What's missing? Um, professional leaders housed inside the institutions, which wasn't always missing, but it's missing now. I would say, like thinking of like masters and MFA programs, like a transition where ensembles can like emerge out of the university, so they can have like an incubator before they go into the professional world. So like a bridge would be good. Yeah, so thank you. This was this very little pre preparation. We had a little bit, not a lot, much more time, but a little bit more. But we saw all the really great workers in the field and the vineyard of theater. So we want to hear some thoughts. It's also uh, um, open, you know, it's a discussion. So it's not that nobody's expecting um, um, a, a, a written paper. So really, the idea is to listen. What's on your mind? What do you think? We live, I think, in dangerous times. I think we live in very serious times. The theater is in a complicated situation at the moment, and I think academia has to also to rethink what is going to take it very seriously. So Daniel, maybe you start this. Um, I'm going to take uh, my part. Can you take the mic? Take, uh, the mic because it's, yeah, oh, take this one. Hello, hello. I got it. Okay. Yeah. I'm going to start with uh, uh, an, an word from my talk that is really connected to the work I believe in, Aul of Patata. Um, I'm going to take into heart that email you sent, Frank. So let's stop me whenever you want. Um, so he said five, seven years of presentation. So that's what I'm going to start doing. I'm going to, this is a really personal point of view. Um, um, as a director, actor, educator, in March, I just came from uh, South Korea teaching as an assistant professor in Seoul Institute of the Art Department, which was, was a really uh, uh, focused actor training program. And now I'm teaching at MIT Music and Theater Arts, which is a completely different take to theater. Uh, uh, that approach from Korea to uh, now MIT is completely different. By that I mean now working with actors that usually don't have a background, don't have a training. Um, um, but my surprise was even though I was working in a focused program for actors training and non-actors training right now with MIT, both scenarios, situations, my approach has been the same. I have noticed in the eyes of the students a hunger to be visceral, to connect. So my approach, my answer to what we're going on right now is to embrace germs, decolonization, and pathophysics. 
uh, after the pandemic, I felt that there was a fear to touch, to connect face to face. Um, so I, don't, I didn't know how I was going to be making or uh, theater or, or, or teaching theater. So that was a big question. Um, so the first production I did after the pandemic was my loneliness. Uh, uh, at this it was an experimental musical with deaf actors, deaf and hearing actors, written by Robert Leons. This took play at the Ohio Theater, uh, now they're close to the Ohio Theater. Anyway, uh, audience participation um, through consent has always been part of my theater alphabet, but I had no idea how to approach it after the pandemic. So not knowing how to move forward in that first project, I decided to embrace fear, fuck it, celebrating germs, no fourth wall. Then the reaction of the audience was really beautiful. Uh, as a surprise reaction, uh, um, feedback, reviews, uh, overwhelming. And the audience wanted to connect. The same thing happened with Joe in South Korea, uh, in Mahman and Denon in Ankara, Turkey. Uh, even though I was not speaking the language of when I was in, in those countries, still there was a need to connect, a need to communicate. Uh, again, people wanted germs. They wanted to play. They wanted to connect. And again, I saw it in their eyes. Uh, and again, I'm, talk I'm talking from a practical point of view, not, not an academic point of view, like academia, great also to practice in the field. Uh, same thing is happening to with me in academia right now. I see the hunger of the students. Uh, they don't, they want to connect, but they don't know how to connect. Um, uh, so uh, 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 let me see, I just wrote, uh, I think academia should absorb what is happening in the present time uh, without forgetting the macro of history. We must take this information, digest it, and hopefully take create a free subversive created space lab to vomit all this and see what comes out. That's the academic classroom I'm trying to create and fight for. I try to train actors to listen to their inner tempo and voices. Actors are with deep visceral op uh, opinions about art and why art. A space that they're allowed to be stupid and make mistakes. A space where we celebrate diversity. This has been my experience uh, performing teaching in the US and abroad, and the results have been positive so far. And I want to start with two thoughts from uh, two, two words on them from my mentor at Columbia University and a program. Uh, the first word is Ipsy Dixie, and the second one is Kulen. Ipsy Dixie means those who remember to hear beyond the words. Kulen, the one on one dialogue. There's no magic formula or equation, the formula is always changing. And then the roots of everything, for me, theater is going back to the circle, the fire. We have this mysterious need to tell stories to each other. We must move forward without forgetting the past. Three last sentences, I'm going to shut up. There's no movement that is going to dance. There's no movement that is going to dance. There's no sound. There's no song that is going to chant. There's no action that is not a prayer. Anyway, I don't know what I'm saying, but hopefully this creates some kind of discussion. Hi um, everyone. And it's a little bit of a tough act to follow. I'm not a practitioner. I'm um, I'm a cultural producer, and I've been working in New York for the last ten years. Um, and I've been working mostly in the field as well. I've been teaching um, at the um, Arts Administration Masters at CUNY. Um, and I think um, some of what you would all been saying was um, interesting to me. Sorry, uh, I didn't see that in the this morning, so I didn't prepare for five minutes. But um, something, something that you were mentioning, and this was mentioned also in the previous panel, was uh, the lack of connection with practitioners, um, the lack of excitement, um, the, lack, the lack of professional theaters um, in institutions, and the lack, lack of incubation or the lack of incubators. And a lot of that is what I've been dedicating my life to and, and my work to. Um, right before my current job, I was at um, the shed and one of the things that we did was an open call and thinking about how do emerging professionals in the performing arts and in the visual arts transition to a professional arena, how can we support them? Um, I think a lot of this is also about how do we work after the pandemic and so that has been inviting artists in. I, I was laughing when you said South Korea because I'm coming to South Korea in May next year and I want to hear all your recommendations um, to a conference called Arts in Society. And we're going to be specifically talking about um, engagement and curation. And what does this mean in terms of how do we create audiences, which is also something that you were talking about. How do we ensure 
that artists that are brought in not only to create their work, but also to connect with others and to create what I call like mirrors and windows, mirrors for others to see themselves reflected in and windows to discover something about someone else and, and something new. Um, and I think that's what we as professionals, was we, what we as uh, practitioners need to continue doing. I'm particularly very interested in seeing that creating an audience and building an audience is more about like listening to practitioners and allowing them to bring their own communities into spaces, uh, many times from professional institutions or, or for, for big, predominantly white institutions have a hard time doing that and allowing for you know tickets to be free or very accessible to go to these communities. So that's something that I've been thinking a lot about. I've been thinking a lot about how do we disrupt and how are artists the best people to do that? Um, in the panel before also, um, they were thinking about like, you know, how community, um, queer performance communities didn't need to be uh, like brought into institutions or academic institutions and how we need to like keep those spaces sacred. And I agree and, also, I know, for example, an artist like Carmelita Tropicana, who is like one of the founders of WOW Theater, um, one a, a queer practitioner, got invited by Yale and really um, changed the way in which those young people were being educated and we were being trained. Um, and I think engagement curating to me is that is how do we bring artists to be those um, agents of change in institutions? Um, so just sharing a couple of the things that I'm thinking of right now and how do we continue preserving uh, um, and inviting those artists and, and preserving legacy as part of it. Thank you very much. Alexis, yes. Hi, I'm Alexis Jamal. I'm an associate professor at Silverman School of Social Work. Uh, that's under CUNY, under Hunter College. So you're probably wondering why I'm on this panel. <laughs> well, I use, I try to integrate um, drama-based and theater-based arts with social work practice and, um, and to bridge many divides that were mentioned. So bridging uh, the macro and the micro, bridging the micro-macro divide. So understanding how macro processes have micro consequences, for example, um, you know, with culture, uh, laws, customs, you know, they're influenced by our values and our beliefs and how um, I think maybe some of you may know the Clark and Clark doll study uh, in the 1960s, which uh, demonstrated internalized anti-Blackness. So these young kids, four years old, you know, three years old, five, five years old, um, Black, many kids of color, uh, Black kids were asked to uh, pick which doll, and one doll was black, one doll was white. And um, so they were asked, which is the good doll? Which is the bad doll? Which is the pretty doll? Which is the smart doll, right? And so every time there was a, a good characteristic, it was the white doll, right? And every time there was a bad characteristic, it was the, the, the black doll. So, you know, we have all of these um, messages of white supremacy, of anti-blackness, that are in our culture, uh, that are internalized and we're socialized into. So, and that causes a lot of problems from the molecular, from our, from, you know, it gets under our skin uh, all the way up. So I, as a radical, critical social worker, and actually I'm a soul show worker, S-O-U-L, <laughs> show worker, I'm all about bridging the micro macro divide and creating multi-level interventions uh, that are grounded in critical theory. And I also have a very interdisciplinary background. So I started out uh, with an education in law and then, you know, very quickly understood how, one, how unjust our criminal justice or criminal legal system is. Um, and uh, I have a background in applied theater and of course, social work. And so I just, uh, I have a lot of notes, but I'll probably get to them throughout the conversation. But I just want to end with something that blew my mind when I was in my master's program in applied theater. Um, you probably have heard of Jim Crow, right? Um, so Jim Crow were, were the laws that, uh, 
you know, legalized anti-blackness and discrimination and, and segregation and everything like that. Uh, and until a couple of years ago, I thought Jim Crow was a person. I thought he was a senator and that, that he proposed these laws. Little did I know, Jim Crow came from the theater. He was a menstrual performer. So I'll just read real quick. The Jim Crow persona is a theater character developed and popularized by entertainer Thomas D. Rice in his menstrual shows, a racist depiction of African Americans and of their culture. Rice based the character on a folk trickster named Jim Crow that had long been popular among Black enslaved people. So that's, you know, we can use theater to um, oppress and to harm and to dehumanize, but we can also use theater to heal, to process um, uh, collective harm, and to transform. Thank you. Thanks. Um, I don't wonder what you're doing on the panel. I'm so glad you're here. Um, uh, I'm Toby Sinoda, and I'm an associate arts professor at NYU and the chair of the undergraduate drama program at NYU. Um, I, I don't I, I don't have prepared remarks here, but I, I, I think I want to take up the question that was posed in the summary of the panel, um, one of which was you know, in asking about what the role of academia is in the contemporary historical moment. And um, this question was posed about whether, uh, I'll be paraphrasing now, but whether the role of academia is to reflect, mirror, theorize, and document, or to participate in transformation and to help create the change we want to see. And the thing that I've been sitting with most in preparing to come in today was that I don't understand those to be separate sets of actions, right? That I don't know how um, any of them happen without one another. I think this is something that uh, all of us who engage in creative practice of any kind are really familiar with, right? That any process requires moments where you leap and moments where you assess and moments where you revise. Um, that uh, every process requires both uh, the risk of choice and action and transformation and participation, and then also reflecting, mirroring, theorizing as a way of participating, right? Um, and so uh, I've, uh, you know, not to turn this into a plug for NYU, but I think part of the reason why I've been there for so much of my career, why I'm a student there, why I continue to believe in that, um, that program is because there is such uh, an understanding that, um, that scholarship and practice are not bifurcated, they're not separate endeavors. They are uh, symbiotic endeavors and in some ways are the same endeavor actually. Um, and thinking about uh, you know, what the role of academia is in the, in the contemporary historical moment for me is the same that it's in any historical moment. I mean, that, um, I don't know, there can be a tendency to think about academia as the keeper of a canon of knowledge. Um, but actually, right, its intent is to be an incubator for the generation of new knowledge, right? This is the, the purpose of, of the academy. And then within that, to educate young thinkers and makers to come as humans, to um, participate in the making of knowledge and meaning in the world. And that is true no matter what the circumstances are, no matter what the contexts are. Um, and in, in, uh, I really, really appreciate um, this uh, this idea about joy and fun in learning. I'm a big nerd for progressive education models, and I think um, the biggest job of any educational institution is to help people learn how to learn and to help people learn how to love learning so that they can be self-driven, curious engagers with the world outside of a formal classroom throughout their lives. Um, and I think this is something that artists uh, lean toward organically, um, a kind of uh, curiosity and what if mentality, um, which is what generates us as makers, right? But I think that's um, that is a, a need for any person who decides to enter the world as a permanent learner, right? How do we engender curiosity in a way that's joyful? 
um, that makes the students, I think the, the thing I think about with our current generation of students particularly is uh, how much fear they carry. And I think this has always been true. I've been teaching in undergraduate spaces since like 1998. So I, um, this is not new for our graduates that they desperately crave the security of some sort of handbook or manual for how to navigate the world. And especially in the field of theater and performing arts, they, uh, given the historical insecurity of that profession for folks financially, that they want to know, what do I need to do to survive it? What do I need to do to make it? And it's a myth that there's no such insurance policy for them. And uh, I feel like a huge part of what an undergraduate education is for these students in particular is disabusing them of that desire. Um, and, but also um, particularly right now, they have so much terror uh, of getting things wrong. They have so much terror of not knowing. They, they, they and an almost kind of um, uh, moral conviction that there should be the right way and that um, we should all be following that right way. And it's just not how, it, what it means to be human, <laughs> it's not what it is. And um, a huge part of what I consider my job to be in the classroom is helping them develop the muscularity of um, being able to sustain what they don't know, to be able to sustain uh, what is uncomfortable for them, to be able to sustain despair. Um, and to be able to continue to move through even those things with a continued curiosity and what if mentality and a stance as a learner. Um, because the, I feel like we need them to have those skills uh, to shape the next half century of the culture world and share together. Um, yeah. All right. Thank you. I'm Sylvain Guillot, I'm a theater scholar and theater maker in the Department of French Literature, Folk and Culture at NYU. Um, so I, I do speak from a sort of interstitial space here because um, so I've been uh, teaching, mentoring students, running programs in the US for the past 15 years. But at the same time, my archives, collaborations, and most of my practice is anchored in the French and Francophone world. Interstitial too, because um, I'm a theater historian, but with a strong interest in the contemporary stage, both in the US and in Europe. Uh, and also interstitial because I'm um, I'm developing and co-leading um, different projects uh, at the intersection of uh, scholarship and uh, creative practice, so research-based practice and uh, practice-based research uh, at the same time. So the way I understood the topic of this panel um, was quite intimidating, I have to say, what was basically performance when crisis has become a condition for everyone, what can academia do and for whom? Um, so obviously um, we cannot answer that question, but with humility and openness. That is to say, both with, um, with the caution uh, that is required um, in a moment of rapid socio-technopolitical change, um, and with the urgency that is called for by it. Um, so then the question for me in the past years uh, has been how to be slow and fast at the same time. How to listen uh, rather than to prescribe, and at the same time act rather than be a mere observer. Um, I think that the past three years, uh, since uh, uh, the spring uh, 2020, I've put in the forefront uh, three major questions. For me, first, who gets to tell whose story, uh, as Wanda Taylor Kelly puts it? Second, how to elude uh, power dynamics at play in the rehearsal room and in the classroom? And third, after theaters across the world, world were deemed inessential and forced to close their doors, what is the actual necessity of making performances and making performance studies? So, in this context, which is um, very uh, bright. Uh, I feel that we have to reinvest um, the conception of theater as a relational aesthetics, uh, in the sense used by uh, the French reference, of course, uh, French curator uh, Nicolas Bouillot to describe a practice of art based on human relations and uh, their social context, that is to say, the aesthetics of the encounter, of resistance to cultural homogeneity 
uh, based on inclusion and rooted in uh, decolonizing degrowth and the need for redistribution. So I think I, I, today I, I would share a review with humility and openness some of the guiding principles that have solidified for me in the past years. For me, has, as I said, a educator scholar, an educator, a maker, and also an academic administrator. So I do in this interface, which is not always very comfortable. Um, so um, among this kind of guiding or tentative uh, humble uh, principle, there is of course uh, uh, an ethic of radical diversity, which is not only to create space for, but prioritizing perspectives, practitioners, and spaces which have been historically underrepresented within the theater establishment. So it goes, of course, with decolonizing. Uh, syllabi and art making techniques, but also recruitment, recruiting uh, colleagues and students of different color, race, disability, gender, and social background. It also goes with decentering our research as scholar by paying more attention to what I call local exceptions. Uh, that is to say, uh, initiatives that can be small. Um, that provide alternative models of cultural production and consumption, both today and throughout history. And it also goes with diversifying the methods, methods through which uh, knowledge are produced and disseminated, um, in particular by including embodied practices as a way of researching and as a way of writing. Uh, how paradoxical it might actually uh, sound. Another uh, tentative principle is a, a commitment to a cultural mediation, uh, understood as um, how to make everyone a cultural player. And uh, it goes with a redefinition of the artist, um, not only as a maker, but also as a facilitator. So this is a sort of a key module of our times. Uh, but um, which I think is important for me that it entails actually new competencies on the part of our students and on, on our own part related to mediation, something which is mostly kept out of the conversation in academia now. And for me, the questions are, because there are many, how to make students aware of the possibilities of intermediary spaces and not only like a big commercial what we're seeing, how to empower them to inhabit these other commons as defined by Fred Botton and Stefano uh, Hani. How to train them to imagine projects of smaller scale. How to run a collaborative and participative structure because it's not even skill. Uh, to train them how to approach dialogues with local communities, same thing, this is not even a skill, to contribute to the development of applied theater in the region. And all of these are a lot of questions, not to mention, of course, the challenge related to the economic viability of this kind of project. So what is our responsibility when we kind of encourage our students to go there, uh, when we know that that's not where the money uh, actually is? Another principle would be maybe the last one. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. um, uh, like the 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 to promote a, a, a practice of extra disciplinarity, uh, as defined by a philosopher Brian Holmes, which seems to me to be even more needed in a, uh, in our harsh world of division. Uh, so the idea of extra disciplinarity is that people with an artistic background, whatever it means, should go on terrains as far away from art and as diverse as, I don't know, biotech, AI, urbanism, psychiatry, hospitals, prisons, to bring forth on those terrains the capacity of theater to provide a sense of production and mutual care, as it was said, but also the capacity of theater to confront the community and our communities to their own dissensions. And I think that the dissensual dimension of theater is actually key to a moment when it's getting harder and harder to be in dialogue with, uh, with, with, with each other. Um, and along those lines, and I will, I will end uh, uh, on that, I, I think there is a, today a large space within academia, a large space to innovate uh, and a real potential uh, at the intersection of research and creativity. 
collaborative practice uh, as a way to engage with non-academic and non-artistic uh, audiences, but also to develop um, I don't know, some sort of uh, interstructural or transversality uh, through partnerships at different levels, uh, beyond professional and also beyond national boundaries. Uh, I, I, I recommend that. Yes, thank you. Um, as Fredo is there to inspire, to see what's there in the moment, of course, uh, everyone who's here on the panel would deserve one and a half hour talk. And maybe we do that also uh, on our stable talks, which we often do, and to hear more from you. But now we react um, to also what inspiring things you said and what's in the world. Hearing all this, what do you think? <laughs> I'll go. Um, uh, one of the things that lifted out most, actually two things that you just said that really lifted up for me, um, coming back to your initial question of like what's missing, is the the um, the trust in slowness and time, or I guess whatever the opposite of urgency is. Um, I, and you know, there's such a, uh, I think this is true in the field, in the industry, in academia as well, um, especially as uh, education has become more and more expensive, um, of an urgency to produce in large amounts or in a, a lot of frequency. Um, and um, it's not uh, profitable or efficient to allow something to have a lot of space and slowness um, to explore and discover itself. And um, what you were saying about scale, that um, uh, I'm a biased toward a minimalist sort of a way of working, not necessarily as an aesthetic, but just as, a, as an economy. And I, um, you know, I think that there's both in the industry, and particularly in New York and in academia for the students, there's a sense of um, uh, money and spectacle and scale being equivalent to larger levels of mastery or greater levels of legitimacy and visibility that um, with greater professional legitimacy and visibility come larger budgets, right? That this is how, this is the latter. And um, I, you know, I'm a big believer of that, like you should have, if you have $5 in the clip light, you should be able to make something absolutely masterful. And um, I, I think there's less and less space to invest in that kind of work and what's to demonstrate what's possible there, not just in terms of the, um, how much the body by itself accomplishes, but also with um, how much aesthetically is possible uh, in terms of design, uh, in terms of technology, in the simplest of configurations and with very, very little cost. Um, but there's a, uh, you know, unsurprisingly, I guess, in this country, right, there's a, an attachment where if you're spending very, very little money, then it's somehow not enough, uh, that the work is not enough, that there's not enough there that you can do. And um, I'm interested in um, thwarting that expectation in the students in particular, especially uh, knowing what they're inheriting and um, looking down the road in the next 20, 30, 40, 50 years about what they're inheriting, that I think they're gonna need to be able to be scrappy and return to a kind of hustle that is not the kind of curated institutional festival framework that we're operating in now. Thank you. Um, so uh, a bunch of ideas came to me, and I'll say some and then wait for my turn again. Um, so one, I heard uh, from a colleague, another social work colleague, uh, Gita Mehotra, that we move in the direction of the questions we ask. So I like to keep that in mind because we have posed a very big question for this for this panel and for our work. but. We have to dare to ask the questions because that's the direction that our work will then move in. And it's not about finding the answers, but about asking more questions. One question leads to the next question. And so I like to keep that in mind uh, so that I don't feel bad when I don't have the answer to like 
and racism or something like that, which brings me to the point what you just mentioned about scale, both mentioned about scale. And um, so my, I, I use a, a theory that I started to develop during my dissertation. Um, and that, that theory is all about developing critical consciousness and tapping into radical imagination and then putting that consciousness into action. And one of the things that in the action prong that the theory ends on is called critical action project experiment. So it's, uh, it's to address that scale question, which we don't have to you know, do action that will win a Nobel Peace Prize, right? We could plant seeds, we could start ripples. Um, you know, I think that, um, a lot of things that we have mentioned, like the urgency, the, the perfectionism, the wanting to get it right, is all part of white supremacy culture. And so when we start to you know, excavate that and uh, counteract that, then we, we get to these other um, ways to incubate ideas. I mean, that, like thinking of this as a laboratory is, and, 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 it, and it's experimental. I mean, America is an experiment that has gone very poorly and it needs to end in some ways, but um, you know, that's, that's the work. And um, so just another thought. Um, I also think that there's uh, what you mentioned, uh, told me about the, uh, the fear that students have and the fear that professors have. Um, you know, there's educational trauma you know, that we have all been socialized to, that we've all been socialized in. And it's about, you know, having the right answer, being trained for the test that we can't take risks anymore. And then we also have conflated uh, the idea of safety with the idea of comfort. And I think that's a big issue within, uh, with, within the educational environment that, you know, you can be safe and uncomfortable, and that's a good thing. Uh, you know, I, I like to give the example that uh, you know, when a when a when a caterpillar turns into a butterfly in its little cocoon or chrysalis or whatever it's in, you know, growing wings probably is not comfortable, but it's it's safe. So um, I think that's also what the what what pairing critical theory with the arts can help. Um, as we move toward asking questions. I'll come back to the idea of urgency because um, I remember one of our timelines in the past was like the urgent issues of our time, right? Like, um, and I understand the rapid movement but I don't conflate it with urgency in that sense. I think there's something about um, urgency and linked to relevance that I'm very interested in. Um, and um, again, going back to the publics and who is the work for, and I'm, I'm gonna keep going away from academia a little bit because I do see, or, or my experience in academia has been like connecting students to kind of the real world as much as I could and bringing a lot of colleagues uh, that are in the field to share their experience from being in the field. Um, so just to say that I think one of the issues that um, many times we're finding is that we're doing work for doing work and because we think it's going to be commercially successful, but not necessarily because we're thinking of what are we trying to say, who is this for, and how do we build new audiences? Um, so all that you were saying, I thought immediately, uh, and going back to something that um, we were all talking about at the beginning is like it, when the pandemic started, um, A, everything was canceled and delayed, B, a lot of big institutions took their archives out, right? And we're like, okay, we have all of this past work, we're not gonna pay artists again because you know we already paid them at the time that they did it. And I think, uh, 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 not to bring myself as an example, but just to say like, one of the things that we were thinking at the time at the shed was like, actually like, no matter what, like how do we A, get artists money? Because we cannot do the work, but they need money. They don't have social um, insurance or health insurance. 
And so how do we support them? And B, what do public need right now from us? And so we started a digital uh, series where we invited artists to think about like, what do you want to do? And they were, you know, performing really and thinking about like new models. And so thinking about like, for example, there were two artists that we worked with, uh, two composers that find, found in um, Zoom a completely new way. And at the time Zoom was very new to all of us and a completely new way of using it and a completely new way of talking about what was going on. Um, about like the numbers of the pandemic, the bringing you know poetry and music and um, and participation to the space, right? And so I'm bringing this example just to say I think urgency doesn't necessarily isn't necessarily the problem. I find the lack of intentionality to be the problem and the lack of relevance and the lack of thinking. What are we trying to do here? Um, yeah, just adding that. Just to think. Continue thinking about it. I just want to like what it comes to mind like listening to everybody like uh uh we all agree that theater brings people together and i think what we're searching now right now is how i mean destroy destroy the clock and then how we build it back to, like together how we uh, assemble that i mean like bringing uh late rights new people to the academia to uh to disorient uh, uh students in the classroom uh embracing environments where people are looking, especially MIT, like they they really want to get it right, all the questions, they really want to be uh, precise, am I doing it right, am I doing it right, sorry, my French fuck that, you know, like just play, just make mistakes, uh, so creating that, and that, that new uh, theater or movement uh, between, I mean, academia and also in the practical world that, 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 that we can hear your voices. I don't know, like, that's what comes to mind, but we all agree that theater brings people together. And I think that's really important. When it comes to mind, I mean, moving from like this idea of um, togetherness, maybe to the idea of collaboration, is because it seems that we kind of all, I mean, we, we are from like different professional field, see for the traditional compartmentalization of the, so, the cultural field, and we all agree. So I think that there is also a, a, a dramatic need for more collaborations. And I think that uh, we've seen in the past decade uh, an obvious uh, shift from uh, this uh, traditional uh, borderlines between artistic practices, between different spaces in the in society, in the, in the social field, to a sort of broader continuum, uh, meaning like artists, of course, working with uh, and across uh, different um, uh, arts, but also uh, artists combining different roles in the creative process. And I think that this shift has also challenged deeply the traditional uh, distribution of competencies and also like these power dynamics also in the, within the, the, the creative process. And I also feel, I'm mean, speaking from my um, uh, educator with my educator hat, uh, that this is something that we don't do enough uh, in, in, in the classroom. It's just like to develop many more uh, and experiment, um, implement collaborative methods that bring together uh, students, but also like students with other so social agents, um, and also, uh, also I think that we don't all of us we don't have like the skills for collaboration, and I think that we can take that for granted that this we just need to be in the same room and to work together and it's going to work. Um, and I, I also, I mean, for me, that's been a real question because I've been working with also digital developers, uh, scientists, uh, as well as uh, scholars and art makers. We, it's very hard to find the same vocabulary, the same language, and also the same relevance. I mean, when we, when, when, when we conceive of as a tiny relevance, and um, that's quite an abstract question, but I like this idea of the pluralization of relevance is really something I, I've been um, struggling with, I to say, in, in, in the past years. Yeah, <clears throat> as you see, it's, it's, it's big. <laughs> what we talk about, but it's very serious. And what people say is it's very significant. You know, but what, why are we doing this? 
I think this is a good idea. Why? You know, and it has to be different. We learned that not only because of COVID and the but so the question is, is it kind of a renaissance, something that has to come back, how it was, with Kurkowski and Schaffner and Nushni, or, or is it a revolution, like something has to turn? Is it something new? What do you all, what do you all see? How do you feel? I, like for that question, I think I mentioned the fire and the circle. I'm going as a dinosaur, I'm going old school in that sense. I'm embracing three-dimensionality and time germs. Uh, I know there's a lot of technology going on, which is great, and a lot of people are doing great work with technology. But uh, for me, what I'm seeing with the audience as a practitioner, like being on stage, directing or teaching, uh, there's a need to connect. And germ is the key. That's what I'm seeing. Germs. Germ. Germs is the key. And I'm seeing it, like here and abroad. So it's not a uh, see it. So uh, I think that's the way how we move forward with your, that's my take. Do you mean that in terms of like being willing to infect each other? Uh, like this, I, we germs, we create antibodies, we germ, we, 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 you know, we, when well, you're educated, you take birth feet and you create antibodies that this fear after the pandemic of masks, not touching, that break that, like people want to have People want, and we invite people. There's a lot of clowning working in the work uh, the company does. Uh, so, and people want to participate. They want to be there. So we stop the play, like bread and pop, and we stop the play. We give them alcohol or whatever. We feed them, and then we continue with the play. People are, eh, that's what I mean by terms. Yeah, to connect. Yeah. 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 May I just add a little comment? Um, I think we also need to define um, the metaphorical terms in the sense that I, I'm thinking also of disabled communities, for example, that have been connecting digitally for decades. It's not even a new thing. And, and where safety means a different thing and where there's been so many deaths, et cetera. And, so, and, and where there's also a lack of accessibility in moving through spaces. So I, I love the idea, but I also think that we need to be open. And that's why I brought the example before of like this um, performance by Zoom. I think there's many, many ways. Um, and I think it's just about finding intentionality in whichever way, whichever arena we're connecting in. And I agree absolutely about connection, but I think also like, can we keep being super open-minded on, on what does connection look like? and all the ways it can take place in. To your question, I, um, you know, I feel like there's the piece of me that wants it to be about a return to like the fundamentals of body and floor and space and time. And then there's the part of me that's like, well, no, it has to be a turn, right? Like we're entering into a new space of a new era. And I, I was just thinking that I, I think what I think about more is like an allowing, right? Like it'll, uh, there are things that are um, uh, structures in the way that the performing arts operate in the United States that are uh, disassembling, closing, wobbling, right? That there's a... Uh, it feels to me like there is a, a really stark unsustainability to the way in which things um, are, are done structurally, operationally. That, um, and a, an attachment to wanting to preserve institutions. Oh, I'm getting into scary territory here. But I, uh, I, I wonder about whether it's, it's about an allowing for things to fall if they need to fall, and then discovering what's possible there. Um, and I mean that operationally, I mean that artistically, I mean that in terms of intention, I mean that in terms of content, I mean that in terms of education. And I think, um, you know, rooting back into academia for a moment, I think, you know, one of the big conversations that has been coming up amongst our own faculty is in the, in the wake of Zoom school, right, and coming back into everyone reacclimating into teaching in person again, like blissfully, and also 
uh, weirdly, right? Yeah, it's different now. And um, finding also that the students are radically different even than they were three years ago. Uh, their brains are different. They process information differently. Um, they process social experience differently. And so it requires uh, new approaches to pedagogy. Um, you know, in the spirit of teaching the students you have and not the students you think you should have or wish that you had, right? That it's, um, there's a, a really immediate need for new pedagogies. Um, and uh, I, for me, that's less about um, there needs to be something, you know, like a turn or a return, but more of a, a there needs to be a presence. There just needs to be a present attention to what is in the room and a willingness to uh, let go of and allow to draw things as they have been that have been competent and comfortable and be willing to step into the unknown with them about what fig figuring out where we are now and what's possible from where we are once we let those things go. Um, so I can't really speak to uh, a return or uh, something new because I don't, I don't have the, um, uh, formal education in theater. So I, I'm not exactly sure what that looks like. Um, when I, I use theater as a tool, right? As a, a tool to raise consciousness, as a tool uh, for action. Um, and, and it's a tool uh, for really aesthetic distance, right? So, um, and, and it can be a, a tool for aesthetic distance on the on the field of theater, uh, and I, I love that idea of aesthetic distance because it you know it's about reflection and reflecting, and if you know if you're too close to a mirror, you can't see, right? And if you're too far away, you can't see. So that's what theater does in in, in my work is that it helps to put people at the right distance so that they can see themselves, they can see others and relationships and environment, um, and then be able to figure out how do we address past harms? How do we disrupt current harms? How do we prevent future harms? How do we humanize? How do we build, a, how do we collectively build a society that supports everyone's humanity to the fullest extent possible? Uh, so I use theater as a transformative tool. Um, and I, so I'm not really thinking about how to transform theater itself. Um, and I guess the last thing I'll say about the reason why theater is so um, amazing for me and, uh, and for what I do is because when we think about social, biopsychosocial, cultural, environmental problems, um, usually we get stuck at, in one of two places or both places. One is figuring out what to do, and the other place is figuring out how to do what we need to do. So the what is creativity, and the how is spontaneity. So theater taps into both of those uh, components, and that's why I think it's just such a wonderful transformative tool. I think that rather than talking about revolution, um, which I think we cannot, as an investigation, we cannot assess at the moment. We're right in the middle of it, so that's really hard to you know to escape a sort of a theological way that we see that okay, that's where we are going. It's a complete overthrow of uh, of past practices. Um, I usually think more in terms of multitude. Uh, and really the way in which this political concept has, has been theorized by Tony Negri. So this idea of the multiplicity uh, of projects, practices uh, that are uh, engaged in a sort of the dual um, uh, process of both emancipation toward um, hegemonic uh, uh, orthodox, Practices and anarchies. 
So emancipation on one hand and um, sort of a reimagination of uh, what has been known. And then it creates a sort of a constellation, a complex and heterogeneous network. And I think that this heterogeneity now is absolutely key. It's an heterogeneous network of social agents, of organizational dynamics, because all these projects actually work uh, on different administrative and uh, organizational ways of practices. And to return to the question of academia, is that actually, I mean, I don't know, but I, I feel that academia could be a sort of prismatic space for this heterogeneity which is both um, absorbing it, uh, reflecting it, analyzing it, but also contributing to this process of pluralization of practices, really the same way a prism as an object, um, um, at the same time reflect, refract, bend, and is also transformed by the light that goes through it. So I think that academia is, is that would be my metaphor, <laughs> the metaphor of the prism. Um, and the question of the return of some or not, I think that history also shows us that theater uh, in the history of the practice has held both as a space of crystallization for conservative and discriminatory thinking and as an emancipatory tool. Uh, and I think that is still the case. I mean, there is types of theaters that or artistic practices which actually um, uh, solidify uh, conservative sort of what togetherness should be, why there are uh, emancipatory practices. And then I think the question is what a revolution would be? Would that be to who would be the person deciding where the line between the two uh, is? Um, should academia be that space or not necessarily to decide, but to think about the complexity of deciding and making that, that choice? And then there is a question of institutional, yeah, um, question about what we need to do with that. Um, that's slightly confusing. So <laughs> I would like to bring one more thing to the table, um, and I think someone mentioned sustainability, and one of the things that I've been thinking a lot about is also what happens after, like we are in a clear moment of crisis, like I think for me, for example, festivals like Under the Radar and American Realness that have been like such foundational emerging, like revolution, if you will, or at least disruptive or interesting spaces of creation have disappeared in the last couple of years. Um, many small spaces are struggling to a really uh, concerning degree. Um, and then, you know, larger spaces are doing business as usual and still with a crisis. And you know. um, so just bringing that up, because I think my concern is always like thinking conceptually and uh, about this phenomenon or phenomena, um, but then not connecting with what's really happening out there and how do we bring that together and how do we continue? Um, you know, I don't know if everyone read, but there was a, a recent um, New York Times um, kind of article on Henry Tins and thinking about, um, yeah, what's it called? <laughs> sorry, blanking, um, Lincoln Center and how, you know, they're trying to do a big change and they got um, uh, Shanta to uh, Take to, to join and they're changing the way they're doing things, but they have the whole previous audience and, and the um, people that are putting money into the space, et cetera, complaining and really concerned. And so just, and, and I'm doing a very weird loop to get to the, the idea of like revolution versus um, continuity in thinking about like, how can can we insert in a way revolution or change? I don't want to call it revolution, but definitely change in traditional spaces. How can we think, I think it's something that you brought about, it. how can we rethink um, redistribution and resources? How can we think, uh, about support and, and patronage or patronage 
Um, so just bringing more things to the conversation. Yeah, I'd like to jump in on that actually, because I think um, one of the things that makes me think about is, and you know, I will own the fact that I was living outside the United States for six years and then moved back in like July 2020. Mm -hmm. So my sense of where things are may not be fully plugged in. As in yet, I'm still catching up a little bit. Um, but I, you know, I came up in New York in like the late 90s, early aughts. And the um, the independent theater scene in New York in that time was just overflowing with self-producing artists and companies. And it's my perception that the way that things are now is that where new work is incubated or where emerging artists are developed are in curated spaces, right? That there's somebody making a decision about who to invest resources in. Uh, and who to give incubation space to, because uh, there isn't the same kind of infrastructure anymore economically for artists to be their own incubators and develop their own audiences. And it, it makes me think back to this early point in the conversation about artists bringing their audiences with them into these institutions. But what happens in these curated spaces, right, is that those artists have been plucked out of their contexts and then dropped into this institutional context where there's an existing audience and that was considered um, like a rise of the ladder, right? Mm -hmm. And when I was uh, in my 20s self-producing and producing for other independent artists, the joke all the time is like, the only people in the audience are our own friends. Like we're just making work for each other and that was the complaint, right? But now that's sort of like this, <laughs> this rarity of like, how do we get those people to our theaters, right? And I, so I wonder about where that space is or how do we create that space where artists can be the agents of their own incubation uh, and audience development, as opposed to, okay, here's who has the resources and let's argue about how you're investing them in people or who you're investing in, do you know? What if they're like, uh, yeah, how do we how do we create space for artists to invest in themselves? Um, where did that go? Is that just about rent prices? Like you know, what is where is the independent theater scene on that level? Um, yeah. I was speaking with Rick. Uh, he's the head of the theater program in uh, the uh, Lehman College, uh, CUNY, and we were having. Uh, we were drinks, we were talking, and he was talking about this same thing you mentioned. And one of the ideas he came about, or what he wants to try to do, is to bring people that he trusts together to create some kind of like a artist community or something to start, you know, sharing resources instead of competing for resources. Uh, so that's, I don't know how it's going to happen, but that's something that he has in mind. And so we do any brains, you know, minds to see how who can, we can invite to see what happens, you know, but that would be a, a solution. So instead of like searching and competing a space. Yeah. Um, well, I just a quick footnote about that because I'm actually going to be on a panel later today about uh, initiatives that are um, made uh, in France at the moment. Uh, aside the state-funded system of theater in France, which is like very specific. And, um, and the panel is about what's going on in Marseille, which is a city in the south of France, uh, which is a multicultural city. And um, it's actually about the development of something which is called in French, the, la, la Coordination Nationale des Lieux Intermédiaires, so the National Coordination or National Association of Intermediary Spaces. And intermediary spaces as, are conceived as a, as a spaces that kind of join private and public economies and navigate self-producing resources with, um, with other uh, resources available in the cultural field at the moment, uh, giving also artists much more decisional power um, in, the, in, the, in the programming of these spaces. Uh, and also relying a lot on uh, various partnerships at different levels, both within the city, at the national level, and at the European level. Uh, and I don't really know what we can do with that in the US, as I said. <laughs> I speak from an industrial uh, position, not necessarily knowing how models can be transferred from one, one, one cultural space and to 
put your political space to another one. Uh, but again, I think that there is something there in terms of the, I, I come back to this idea of like co co collaboration, coordination, um, that we really need because we are in this transitional moment of reimagining structures and no one can do that by itself, by, by themselves. And that's, that's really, uh, and I think it also makes me think about like something slightly different uh, that I would also would like to bring to the table, which is like how close, and go back to academia there, but how close academia should be in dialogue with activism. Uh, and I think there is a lot of pushback at the moment, and this is really clear in France also, but it's also the case in the US, uh, of delegitimizing uh, either scholars or artists uh, whose work is deemed uh, too activist or too political. Um, and, and I think there is also um, there is also a very important conversation that we uh, supposing that we all agree uh, in this space, but that we need to have um, to um, to um, advocate uh, for uh, the political commitment of what we are doing, and again, both as scholars and as uh, as, as thinkers. Yeah, that that is it, every every point is so significant and so important. This just shows how important that we really talk to each other, listen also. Um, before we go to the audience question, maybe every one of you as a question, what is an example? Because now we also moved a bit in the theoretical world, but what is an artist or a group or a project you've been involved in, or it doesn't have to be long the description, or what you saw say, yeah, this is how it should be. This is something different. This is perhaps close to what we talk about in vision now. Is there something you can pinpoint to? Um, I'm going to lift up Josh Gell um, and theater quarantine, and it, which is unusual for me because I am the. We were just talking about this outside. Is like I'm not a tech person. I'm a very like be in the room and just it's a body and a work life. It, it's magic. Um, but what Joshua Gell did, did in the course of the pandemic um, of creating the theater and quarantine project for me exemplifies this thing I was saying earlier of like, okay, well this thing fell down. What do I have left? I've got this this Zoom thing, <laughs> computer camera, and this closet. We're gonna figure that out. This is nothing, right? So for me, the the excellence of what Josh has done is not about even the technology or the the structure and format, right? But it is again about intention and about the the relationship to where whatever the resources are, whatever the moment is, and being able to bring artistry and intention to it uh, with integrity and, and curiosity and exploration. And I think especially some of the early experiments he was doing, um, some of the most theatrical work I've seen on the screen ever in any context, um, and the commitment to theatricality inside of that moment um, uh, I think really exemplifies that the this thing that I was talking about earlier. Yeah. Uh, for for me, is that guy over there sitting there, drawing lines. Uh, these are we done three projects together, right? Or now three or four. Uh, we started before the pandemic and after the pandemic. Uh, the, like we have academia, we have practice, but everything I'm doing in the classroom, we put it in practice on stage and seeing if it's working or if it's not working. And again, audience participation, germs, the, the poetry, the stylization, the nonlinear work. I, I think, I mean, we just, we did the last project at the New Ohio Theater, beautiful experience. Now we continue to develop now, Mercury Store. So I'm really looking forward to what that takes us. I don't know, we don't have a theater now. <laughs> so, uh, but I'm excited, theater wise, where we're going. Uh, so I'll put you in the spot over. <laughs> Um, some work that I'm excited or yeah excited about that I've been part of is um, I designed an elective course for the School of Social Work. Uh, it was called uh, Critical Social Work: Bridging the Micro Macro Divide. And then um, uh, for my thesis in, in the Masters of Applied Theater program, uh, myself and my thesis partners we took that class. I mean we took yeah we took that elective course and we changed it to Critical Social Work. 
bridging the micro and macro divide with applied theater. So we have these social work students uh, learning about applied theater, and then they they actually implemented, they designed a, a session about their interests, um, and then um, uh, implemented their sessions with the CUNY community, and it was amazing. So here we have, you know, uh, breaking out of our silos because I do think it is about collaboration. Um, you know, collaboration is what creates radical imagination and, and so on. And so, and it needs to be interdisciplinary. So that uh, class with uh, Brenna Rorick and Anna Lou Hearn and Tabitha Lopez uh, was great. We did it for two semesters. Um, and then the second thing is uh, I, I created a elective courses for the uh, doctoral program in social welfare. Um, one, it's called, uh, the name keeps changing, but it's something like arts, academia, and activism research. And so just bringing this content to uh, doctoral students, and I'm on a few dissertation committees, and uh, doctoral students are breaking out of the mold of this archaic document um, and doing more creative public-facing work um, with community and in community. So I'm uh, proud of all of that. Um, I will link that that project that I was talking about before um, by two composers, Troy Anthony and Jerome Mellis. Um, and they met each other while like being in the building together by chance and, you know, composed a song together. And this was all before the pandemic. And um, I think um, Jerome had a performance at Joe's Pub. And, and so they played that song together. And I knew about this. Um, and then when the pandemic happened, we invited them to collaborate. Jerome had just um, lost his grandfather. And so they decided that actual ritual was going to be how they were going to connect. And it was a performance that was a ritual. And actually, if you now go to the Shed's website, you won't be able to see the performance entirely. It's just the little pieces of performance because there was so much participation and they wanted to ensure that that was a safe space. Uh, but not only that, um, Troy afterwards, the, when we were able to finally come back in person, um, created a beautiful, beautiful piece about togetherness and coming together um, for which he um, formed a choir of 25 people in one week and since then has created a choir that is incubated at the shed called the Fire Ensemble uh, where anyone can come and sing and he's using song and performance as a way of healing and um, I don't know, togetherness and germs. Um, and I think that's a beautiful example of even how integrated spaces, and I completely agree with you, by the way, uh, about this problem that we have, but those are where the resources are right now, and those are the rents in New York. Um, there's space to be carved to create spaces that are activist spaces and, and, and really uh, different spaces. Oh, yeah, that's for sure. um, so, um, well, I don't think I would define that as a, as a, as a kind of successful initiative, but that's, um, so I'm, um, at least an interesting one, so I'm, um, I'm, a, I'm a co leader of a project of digitization of uh, the administrative archives of the National French Theatre in Paris. And um, what uh, we've been doing uh, almost every year for a long time now, for 10 years now, is um, to, um, to conduct uh, intermedial, uh, intergenerational, interdisciplinary workshops, bringing together uh, graduate and undergraduate students, both from the Francophone world and the US uh, historians, um, uh, developers and designers, uh, performers and musicians to create pedagogical tools, uh, which are mostly digital, but that can only be activated through, um, uh, through an environment when we get together. And uh, students um, have had also the opportunity to go to um, 
classrooms uh, in secondary schools in the periphery of Paris to use these pedagogical tools and show how we can uh, use this sort of uh, connection between uh, research in history, uh, digital possibilities, and uh, performance as a way of performing the archives to a nurse. Uh, like plays and practitioners that have been completely invisibilized by the canonization of uh, literary history um, that can be used also to make visible workers within the theater, which is extremely rich in terms of like, the, 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 the workers that have no place in the history of the theater. Um, uh, and also give this opportunity to uh, to a, a modern young audience who doesn't necessarily have a cultural background to um, fully grasp the relevance of this place from the past, uh, to actually test it or to put them uh, in test uh, through uh, performance-based uh, workshops with the, the musicians and the practitioners who are part of the project. So that's a kind of multi hands Related uh, project uh, that takes different uh, shape depending of the year, but also depending of the energy and also depending on the success of the collaborations, because sometimes it's a real failure. And I, I come back to the fact that collaboration is really, really complicated. We want to keep it late, but I think we have a bit of time between the next and the other one, which we reserve. So we really always have a discussion here. It's important to us. It's a little bit shorter today, but I think all the uh, contributions are very serious, actually, and important. So um, I hope I'll give you first. Hi, and thank you so much for all of your thoughts. Um, my name is Jess, and I'm a PhD. Um, a doctor candidate uh, in the theater and performing program here, and I'm also a practicing dramaturg. Um, and it strikes me that one of the things that we actually didn't define or like settle on was what is the academy? What is academia? Like we did, like, kind of just took that for granted as its own shape and form, and to just call forward the fact that this notion of, of continued learning, continued education, and the continuation of new knowledge is in a moment of precarity as much as live performance is in a moment of precarity. And so just thinking about how these two worlds might be able to support each other in finding the new forms in, in, in bringing performances research and performing research and embodiment to the table. And, and so anyway, I, think, I mean, that's just for a future Siegel talk, but, it's, but I think it's relevant for us to, to think what is academia and how is it serving? And, and I just wanted to point that. Yeah. Or does it go back to Plato's academia? But with you, I mean, then this, this word is charged and has a lot around it, but I was just thinking of the idea of trauma. Um, I teach at NYU, I actually have an adjunct there. And I had a conversation with my ITS classes, introduction to theater studies classes, after we were introduced him to modernism because we'd gone to like a, a, a reading or stage reading of a Bertrand Stein piece. And they said they feel like they live in a just protracted state of trauma. And it came out of a discussion of TikTok and this constant um, just assault of violence that they might get because of like an algorithm. And someone said, Gen Z, this is why Gen Z loves Dada. And I was like, I didn't even know you knew what Dada was. And then that started a conversation about it. And I was just so inspired. And I mentioned that today, I was like, why don't we do a weekend workshop of Dada? If that appeals to you, that's where history and practice actually intersect. And they came to it. I didn't tell them that. They found it. And so I think that, I think that foregrounding the students and listening to them and saying, we don't know, like, I, I'm not on TikTok, tell me about it. Like, I just feel like there's hope. I think it's really easy to feel that we're all getting like sucked down, but they have a lot of answers. And I feel like I'm learning, I know it's cliche, but I do feel like I'm learning more by listening to them and then saying, okay, I have this tool, let's try it. Um, so it's a little bit of hope, I guess. <laughs> Thank you for the work you're doing with them. I would love to do that workshop with you, Mike. Yes. <laughs> so what is what, what comes to your mind? 
<laughs> I didn't prepare my five minutes. Um, I know I, I had a the thing that I that hit me in this was something uh, Tony said because we came up in a similar era, and it just made me think that like we did so much in like mid, also with Robert, like who presented my company. Um, uh in like the 90s and early 2000s and like but yeah at that time we could i could work two nights a week in a restaurant and pay my bills and i didn't have health insurance and and i was like this is awesome nobody we're not making any money but we're doing this thing we love and i think we don't people do not feel that way anymore and i think that's a big difference and i know part of academia for me has been it has like been a place to experiment and support my like my theater habit um and like 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 Daniel was saying like I do look at the classroom as a laboratory not just as like like and it goes back and forth you know what I'm trying with my company or in those shows I'm making is seeping its way into the classroom and what I'm trying in the classroom is finding its way out there so there is uh, a cyclical thing I don't know if those two things are were really as related as they still got with me. Um, but and then and then just something so then said, I remember we were on tour at um, we were at Shia in Paris, like fancy gig. And all the French companies were like, oh, you have to go back to New York because you have a restaurant shift. You know, and it was just such a different, like the such a different reality. Um, that is what I think. Yeah. <laughs> Very interesting. I, I was thinking about uh, a conversation that Frank had with uh, Basil Jones when he said that uh, during apartheid, they closed down all the live theater. And the only theater that was uh, allowed to go was the puppets. Why? Because puppets. Nobody takes him seriously. And this was at the time of Trump and of COVID. And I thought to myself, wow, that's we have to be aware that we're in a potentially hostile environment. And the academic world is and in the universities are where revolution start. But I take issue with your word revolution. I think of it as evolution. And that we, when I was helping develop the New York City Board of Ed website, uh, I spoke to the director and, she, and used the word creativity. And she said, we can't use the word creativity because that is owned by the religious right. Ooh, that's all. <laughs> Good. Um, so uh, with that, um, uh, I really want to thank you again. I hope we will have ongoing conversation that we also perhaps find a way, you know, collaborate, great, create the groups and the thinking, and we really also live what we ask for and do it in real work. But it was very important to hear from you. Everybody in the audience could feel there's a different level of listening and seriousness than, you know, two, three years ago. And I think this is a good thing. So thank you all. And we're going to go off to uh, the next panel. And uh, there's a Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.